Hello students, in continuation with my lecture series on AKTU Energy Science and Engineering for BTEC second year students, I am briefing you Solar Energy Unit 3 of your syllabus. Please do subscribe to my channel as the subscribers will be getting a fully solved model paper one week before the exam. Okay. Now, in my previous lectures, I told you, introduced you to solar energy. I told you about the various reasons why full solar energy does not reach the earth's surface. And I told you about two very important devices, pyranometer and pi heliometer, which are used to measure the sun's radiation. This question, direct radiation and diffuse radiation has been asked in the AKTU exam. In order to make it more clear, let me show you how I have demarcated it with the help of a table. See, direct means anything falling directly. Diffused means scattered in all the directions. So simply let me quickly tell you this answer because this is going to be a 10 mark question. And you can very easily get 10 marks if you make this table. See, the direct radiations are going to have a unique path and definite direction, whereas the diffused radiations have been scattered by molecules, pollution particles, dust particles, etc. in the atmosphere. Direct radiation is going to be very intense at one point of the surface, but the diffuse radiations are not going to be intense because they have been reaching you via scattering. They have been absorbed. Their intensity is very less. Atmospheric conditions like clouds, pollution, etc. do manage to decrease my direct radiation. But atmospheric conditions like clouds, pollution, etc. increase more of my diffuse radiation. The percentage of the sky's radiation that is direct is much lesser in higher latitude. The percentage of the sky's radiation that is diffuse is much greater in higher latitude. Look at this diagram. See, can you see this? This is direct radiation. Wait, I'll show you. Make this diagram in your exam. See, this is my sun here. And look here. This light is falling directly on it. So this is direct radiation and look at this, these rays of light. They are not coming directly. They are coming through any type of other sources via scattering, via diffraction, etc. So I consider them under the category of diffuse radiation. This is important question. 10 mark section C. Differentiate between direct and diffuse radiation. You can even draw this diagram when you are explaining your answer. Okay, as sunlight passes through the atmosphere, some of it is absorbed, some of it is scattered, some of it is reflected. These phenomena happen because of air molecule, cloud, dust, pollutants, forest fires, volcanoes, etc. So the earth's surface without being diffused is uh, the ones that reach direct are known as direct radiations and the ones which get diffused are known as the diffused radiations. Okay. And obviously we don't ever get 100% of what the sunlight is uh, 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 there on the earth. Never ever does it happen that 100% beam reaches the earth's surface. If the atmosphere is very clear, no clouds, nothing, then you can say approximately 60 to 70%. The rest of the 30, 40% has got lost in scattering, diffusion, uh, diffraction, absorption, etc. So uh, you can say that the diffused uh, short wave radiation in which the wavelength ranges from 0.3 to 3 micrometer is coming directly from the sun. Long wave radiations with wavelength greater than 3 micrometer, micro is 10 to the power of minus 6 or longer originates from sources at near ambient temperatures. The atmospheric processes which significantly affect the diffuse radiations are scattering and absorption. The more they get uh, I think this diagram has also been asked in your AKTU exam. See, this is my direct radiation reaching. This is the diffused radiation, reflected ones, 
longer waves reflected and longer sky wave different types of radiation at the earth surface that really reach because this knowledge is very necessary before you go in for designing anything uh, from the concept of solar energy so this is important scientists first measure the amount of sunlight that is falling on a specific location and different times of the year i told you this point earlier also then they estimate the amount of sunlight which is falling on the region at the same latitude with similar climatic conditions measurement of solar energy are expressed as total radiation on a horizontal surface or as total radiation on a surface tracking the sun units of solar power and solar energy in si unit section a question it was asked energy is expressed in joule other units that are used are calorie is a very common unit you can mention calorie anywhere essential subsystems in a solar energy plant this will again be repeated in unit 4 solar collector or concentrator it receives solar rays and collects the energy it may be flat plate type parabolic truck type paraboloid dish fresnel lens energy transport mediums substances such as water steam liquid metal or gas etc are used to transport the thermal energy from the collector to the heat exchanger or thermal storage energy storage solar energy is not available continuously so we store it during day time and we use it at night thermal energy storage battery storage pump storage hydroelectric plant etc energy conversion plant the stored energy is converted for uses like electricity etc power conditioning control and protection system load requirement of electrical energy vary with time the energy supply has certain specifications like industries will require a greater supply small household will require a lesser power supply so that is going to depend from condition to condition sub systems in thermal energy uh, uh, conversion plants are basically you memorize this according to requirement of hot water hot air gas thermal steam plant receiver solar thermal collector solar energy you remember this way see solar energy when it falls it is collected by the solar collector it is transported by the energy transport medium it is stored via whatever medium required after storage it is converted into whatever requirement is there and the conversion is varied according to the voltage supply for my specific purpose electric power here so measurement of solar systems i told you semiconductor physics why is semiconductor physics important in solar uh, energy because my photovoltaic cells are designed based on the basic knowledge of semiconductor physics this is very 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 important from aktu point of view in this unit you get a compulsory question on basics of semiconductor physics so you will be very comfortable when you write the answer of semiconductor what is a semiconductor semi means half conductor is something that is able to conduct so it is a substance whose resistivity is lying between conductors and insulators the uh, semiconductors have resistivity which is less than insulators and more than conductors they have negative temperature coefficient conducting property of a semiconductor changes when a suitable metallic impurity is added to it this is the most important property because of which you are studying semiconductors in solar energy section a question 2 mark why are semiconductors preferred in solar uh, energy they are preferred because they can be conducting properties can be varied 
otherwise i will be restricted but here it will depend upon how much impurity i am adding if i need it as an n type i need it as a p type and this variation and fluctuation is of great use for me while designing anything based on solar energy so they are used extensively in the field of electronics germanium is the most preferred one and transistors were the very old technology they have all been replaced by semiconductors and after semiconductors ic chips have also come into being but the basics of semiconductors remains the same like i will explain you in this diagram see it has been asked in dekit you and this must have been a 10 mark question semiconductors intrinsic or pure semiconductors extrinsic or impure semiconductors when i add a certain amount of impurity here then this gives rise to my p type semiconductors and n type p type have holes and n type have electrons excess in them now as per my requirement i can choose whether i want a p type or i want an n type so this is important this diagram which you can see on the screen for a 10 mark question btech second year paper you are going to write it is a theoretical paper learn how to give answers like this in flow charts in a table format not just copy paste text so please try to make flow charts more for a 10 mark question try to make uh, comparative tables like this all this will fetch you good marks for this theoretical paper intrinsic extrinsic semiconductor 10 mark question intrinsic semiconductors are the pure types extrinsic ones are the impure type intrinsic depend on temperature only extrinsic depend on temperature as well as the amount of impurity added electrical conductivity in this case is low so if i need to design a very small apparatus i will use an intrinsic semiconductor if i need to design a very big apparatus for larger power supply i will go for the extrinsic semiconductor where my electrical conductivity is high density of electrons is equal to the density of holes here because it is pure so the number of electrons and number of holes will remain same here p type n type it is going to vary band gap between conduction band and valence band is small band gap here is high example silicon germanium are all uh, the thing uh, semiconductor examples here they are as compounds gallium arsenide gallium phosphorus etc intrinsic semiconductors the electrons and holes are closely created by thermal excitation number of free electrons is all this word file is there in the drop down box once you subscribe to my channel immediately you will get the access to this word file doping this section a question what is meant by the term doping the process of adding impurities is known as doping because the impurities added are generally pentavalent penta means 5 and trivalent tri means 3 the pentavalent impurities have five electrons in their outermost orbit example phosphorus most common pentavalent atom becomes a donor atom why because what happens is look at this diagram here see suppose i add a pentavalent impurity penta means 5 so four electrons will immediately take a bonding here one will be remaining free and this free electron will constitute the electric current so when impurity added to semiconductor will provide electrons for conduction this way p type i add a trivalent impurity that is 3 so in this case 3 i have added 3 will get bonded 1 will remain free 
that is a hole. So this is pentavalent impurity. One numerical of two marks was asked on this expression, law of mass action. At equilibrium, the product of majority and minority. Majority means if electrons are more, they become the majority. If holes are more, they become the majority. And my, obviously, if electrons are majority, then holes will become minority and vice versa is a constant. And this is mathematically expressed by law of mass action n not p not is equal to n i square where n i is the intrinsic carrier concentration and n not p not are the electron and whole equilibrium carrier concentrations what is meant by carrier transport in semiconductors this is exactly what i explained you right now carrier c this electron lying here, this, this is a carrier. The hole here that is lying is a carrier. Why? Because now this is going to constitute the electric current. So any motion of free carriers in a semiconductor will lead to current. This can be caused by an electric field due to an externally applied voltage because the carriers are charged particles. And if one applies electric field to a semiconductor, the electrostatic forces cause the carriers to accelerate and reach a constant average velocity, after which they go ahead to uh, carry the current. <coughs> Section A question, why is silicon preferred in semiconductors? Because the energy band gap is 0.7 electron, whereas for germanium, it is 0.2 electron. The thermal pair generation in this case is smaller. The formation of silicon oxide layer is easy for silicon, which helps in the manufacture of many components along with integration technology. Silicon is found easily in nature than germanium. Law, noise is less in components that are made up of silicon compared to germanium. This was asked in section A. Important. The main electronic components of semiconductors are your bipolar junction transistors, uh, FETs, field effect transistors, light emitting diode, solar cell, thermistor, variester, transformer, switches, etc. Generation and recombination in semiconductors. Recombination of electrons and holes is a process by which both carriers annihilate each other and electrons occupy through one complete or multiple steps the empty state that is associated with the hole. Carrier mechanism in semiconductors that I have explained to you carrier generation due to light absorption occurs if the photon energy is large enough to raise an electron from the valence band into an empty conduction band, thereby generating one electron hole pair. The photon energy needs to be larger than the band gap energy to satisfy this condition. The photon is absorbed in this process and the excess energy is added to the electron. And what is the difference between metal semiconductor junction and PN junction? Metal semiconductor, the structure of a metal semiconductor junction is like this. See, the metal is attached here and you have the N-type and P-type semiconductors kept in contact, anode, cathode, and this is my semiconductor. Structure and sign convention of a metal semiconductor junction. It has been asked in your exam. It consists of a metal contacting a piece of semiconductor, an ideal ohmic contact, a contact such that no potential exists between the metal and the semiconductor is made to the other side of the semiconductor. 
the barrier between the metal and the semiconductor can be identified by the energy band diagram. Energy band diagram, we first consider the energy band of the metal and semiconductor and align them using the vacuum level. As the metal and semiconductor are brought together, the Fermi energies of the metal and the semiconductor do not change right away. This yields the flat energy bands. Basically, when you are combining a metal and a uh, semiconductor, forward bias and reverse bias, if the positive is connected to the P type and negative is connected to the N type, it is forward biasing. And for the reverse process, it becomes reverse biasing. A large current exists under forward bias, while as no, almost no carrier current exists under reverse bias. When a single semiconductor crystal manufactured with P-type material at one end and N-type material at the other end is joined, we get a P-N junction diode. And when they are combined, excess electrons or holes go into form the P-N uh, depletion layer, which has to be cleared from time to time. Thank you.